Welcome to Tulane University and to the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South screening of Hollow Tree. I'm Rebecca Snedeker and I direct the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South, which is housed in Tulane School of Liberal Arts. We're thrilled to be here with you all for tonight's special screening and discussion with the film's director and three protagonists. We'll begin with a land acknowledgement by Dr. Judy Maxwell. Dr. Maxwell is a professor in the Department of Anthropology, and since 2010, she's been heading a collaborative team of Tulane students and the Tunica Biloxi tribal members and scholars, the Tunica Biloxi Language and Culture Revitalization Program, working to revitalize the Tunica language. We're grateful to Dr. Maxwell for serving on the program committee of the center's Tulane Gulf South Indigenous Studies Symposium for the past three iterations, and to her for launching the new Native American Studies minor within the School of Liberal Arts. Welcome, Dr. Maxwell. Heni hotu, ima kuakere etisa, etoa eheli, hotu lapuch. Good evening, all. I'm uh, Judith Maxwell, it wasn't a surprise, and I'm pleased to be, be here. I greeted you in Tunica, so uh, just a small sample that the language is coming back. The last native speaker died in 1948, but we now have, according to Ethnolai, we have 32 young speakers. The last count I had was 80, but you know, who's counting? All right. I would like to uh, begin this evening, and thank you all for being here, with a land acknowledgement. And the land acknowledgement that I'm going to read to you is the official Tulane land acknowledgement. Uh, if you ever want this land acknowledgement or one like it, it's on the Tulane landing page. You have to go all the way through everything on the page. At the very bottom, there's a link to, the land, to this acknowledgement. But well, let me uh, share this with you and let us all think about what these words mean. The Choctaw, Homa, Chittimacha, Biloxi, and other native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. Their identities are inextricably connected to this place. With gratitude and honor, Tulane University pays tribute to the original inhabitants of this land. The city of New Orleans was not built upon virgin soil, but merely served as a continuation of a great indigenous trade hub known in Choctaw as Bulbancha, the place of other tongues. For thousands of years, people lived along the Mississippi River and Bulbancha served as a place for diverse cultures to come together. We acknowledge the grounds of our campus and the city around us as home to numerous tribes before and after the arrival of Europeans. The tradition of community and sharing demonstrated by indigenous peoples enabled European immigrants to survive in a foreign environment and has influenced New Orleans and the Southeastern culture since colonization began. From food and music to art and language, Native Americans continue to leave their mark on our city and academic community. We recognize that as a result of broken treaties and involuntary removals, Native Americans were often forced from their lands. We remember and pay respect to the communities impacted by these actions. Yet the resilient voices of Native Americans are still heard and remain an inseparable part of our local culture. In that spirit, we acknowledge that indigenous nations that have lived and continue to live thrive here. That's the end of the official land acknowledgement, and I would just like to note that the purpose of a land acknowledgement isn't just to say some words, but to think about what they mean and to think about indigenous people. So I'd like to share just a little bit, tiny little bit uh, more of the Tunica language with you. So in the Tunica language, the word for an indigenous person is oni mahoni. And if you translate that, that means free person. And the Oni Mahoni are contrasted with the Oni Meli, who are uh, people that we would call African Americans today, Oni Rawa, which is literally white people. And the, all of these peoples are divided into dith different ethnic groups. So, for example, among the Oni Rawa, the white people, we have Ingrasa, which you can probably figure out is English. Uh, we have Spanish which you can probably figure out are the Spanish. And then there are the French, who are Oni, Rawa, Kashi, the real white people. Uh, so 
I understand that there's nothing much that we can do about our ancestry. We are who we are. But there is something that we can do about our future. And I hope that in the spirit of the movie that you're going to see this evening and all of us who are gathered together in hope and solidarity, that we can all become Oni Mahoney. Tikach. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. And I'll continue with some more gratitudes. I want to thank Dean Brian Edwards and the School of Liberal Arts Dean's Office for their support. Our team at the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South, Dr. Denise Frazier, Regina Cairns, and Demi Ward in hosting this programming. The Liberal Arts Interdisciplinary Programs who have co-sponsored and publicized this event, Africana Studies, Environmental Studies, and Native American Studies, as well as Tulane Library for documenting this evening. And finally, to everyone who helped spread the word and all of you who have joined us this evening on campus. The New Orleans Center for the Gulf South is an interdisciplinary place-based center that promotes the understanding of New Orleans and the Gulf South region and the region's relationship to the planet. We support research, teaching, and community engagement that relate the local to the global. And all of our programming is based on the idea that the more we understand where we are, the more fully we can engage our democracy and therefore our collective destiny. We have a lot of upcoming events. Uh, we're working with a new registration process. We are grateful to everyone who registered. That means you will also receive our newsletter, which you're welcome to unsubscribe from. But uh, we hope that you might stick around on it. We always feature our events and um, things going on, publications and presentations by our research fellows. And we recommend other people's events and other organization events, uh, as well as advertising select job positions and funding opportunities. We have an upcoming fellowship deadline, a research fellowship deadline that is next Monday, March 13th, and it's called the Global South Fellowship. And for some logistics, for the bathrooms, um, if you all need to go there, head out the doors in the back and take your first left and then another left. And at the end of the film, I want to let you know we're going to let all the credits roll. That doesn't always happen, but we want to appreciate everyone who made this film and just have a minute to continue letting it kind of sink in. And then I'll invite director Kira Ackerman and the protagonist to the stage for a brief discussion and a Q&A. After the discussion, we welcome you to join us in Newcomb Hall. And we'll um, be having people help direct you there if you don't know where it is. Uh, it's on the end of the Newcomb Quad here toward the right when you exit the building. And on the first floor in the faculty lounge, we'll have refreshments and hope to continue the conversation with anyone who's able to stay. Please know that this intro and the Q&A after the screening will be filmed and available online. And a safety note, just please keep a pathway in the aisle for at least two people to pass. So now to the film at last. The film Hollow Tree is winner of the 2022 New Orleans Film Festival's Best Louisiana Feature Jury Award and the Populist Audience Award. The film is a centerpiece in the growing body of work that shares narratives that tell the story of this region from the formation of our deltaic lobes and draws connections between our land, water, racialized histories, and of indigenous and African descended peoples and infrastructure. The director, Kira Ackerman, is the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South Fellow. She received a fellowship for Station 15, which is a beautiful sh documentary short that served as a prototype for Hollow Tree, her first feature film. And in 2019, she received a Monroe Fellowship to support production of this feature film. More recently, she's been an ongoing consultant in the center's strategic planning and has been an invaluable partner to think through the role of climate justice, education, and the liberal arts. She's been a guest speaker at many departments and programs at Tulane, including architecture, digital media practices, environmental studies, and history. And for those of you who are faculty here, uh, we'd love to talk to you about the use of the film in your classes. She also just had an exhibit at the Small Center uh, and I want to mention, speaking of the small center, which is in Central City, some of you may know, is a part of the School of Architecture. There's an exhibit there called Extractivism that relates deeply to this film that I recommend. We're excited to have many of the film crew members with us tonight, uh, many, and also its stars. So in addition to Kira, I want to welcome the film's protagonists, Kinsey Fungi, Tanyelma Da Costa, and Annabelle Pavi. We also have producer Chachi Hauser here, executive producer Jolene Pender, who's also a professor at Tulane, and, ci and cinematographer Maxime Katari. Welcome, you all. 
And we want to also acknowledge Trillian professors and instructors who played a role in the film, Jelagat Chariot, who's an evolutionary biologist in the School of Science and Engineering, and Aaron Chang, who's a former instructor in the School of Architecture, as well as former Tulane professor and environmental historian, Andy Horowitz, who's now at Yale and UConn. And with that, we're now gonna roll the film and we'll see you after. What I'd love to do is um, invite everyone, sorry, I just did that because I'm so moved by the film, I get just um, kind of like, Thematically overwhelmed. It's really beautiful. Y'all have made such a beautiful film. So I want to invite everyone who's here who contributed to making this film, uh, Kira and, and the three protagonists who you've met through the, through the film, and also the producer and cinematographer who are here, and anyone else who's contributed to the film, whether you gave feedback on a focus group or um, showed the film in a class or gave money during fundraising um, in any way. Just please stand up for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm, um, so I'm going to start with some questions. So this is Kira, who you haven't you know, seen on camera yet. <laughs> Kira Ackerman, the director, and Annabelle McKenzie and Tanyalma. And um, I just want to start with asking the protagonists, um, if, if you can bring us into a moment during the filmmaking and the film production where you learned something from, um, from a place where you were that it was previously unfamiliar, and just what was it like being part of this filmmaking um, and, and, and learning from different people in different places? And do y'all have a mic up here? Okay, great. And we can pass these too. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I think of the many moments um, that I could talk endlessly about. One of them that stood out to me was whenever I was out at the Atchafalaya River Basin with Annie and Roy. Um, that's the couple who was talking about the tree that was chopped down, the cypress tree. And what I observed during my time with them was the happiness that can come with living so close to nature. And um, the home that I grew up in was just surrounded by streets. I didn't have a lot of like field time, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, and I, I think that whether you recognize it or not within yourself, every human has this part of themselves that's so drawn to nature because we are from nature. Um, and I really, even from observing the film, like time and time again, I, I observe even more how much they influence me. Yeah. Um, every time I see the boat scenes, mainly the one uh, strapping with my grandpa, um, that is very dear because I, uh, you know, after we filmed that and then like we all went home and started talking about it, um, like everything looked very different to him. So the land slowly, well, eroding very quickly as for him just taking a couple years away from it and him going back and really not recognizing certain places. It was, you know, kind of, like it, it made me kind of like sad for him. Like, wow, like you only been away for couple, you know, years and you going back and you don't even like recognize yourself, you know, and I talk about like a childhood fishing spot and I hold that so dearly because that's, you know, like where we started from and I can go there today and it looked completely different. And I mean, I still have the memories. It's just like to like physically see it, it, you know, it kind of hurts. So. Yeah. Um, I think for myself, just thinking about, um, speaking with Eve, being in Freetown and Cancer Alley and just, oh, you can't, oh, do I need to move it closer? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> um, I was just saying that uh, being, um, speaking with Eve in Cancer Alley and being in Freetown and just learning about how, you know, when you have instances where your own experiences are evidence and for that to not be taken seriously or not to be like credible or that, that was definitely very powerful for me to know that 
um, you know, we're in spaces and, and systems that, you know, um, our, we, um, our, our experience can be devalued, but um, that, that, that shouldn't like keep us from um, holding on to them and knowing that um, we're valid and that that is a source of, of experience, that is a source of credibility, just as any expert or anything like that, that evidence is important. And yeah, it also takes me back to being in the Army Corps of Engineers and being like, I know what I know, I know what I see, I know what I've I heard, I see this. And um, for, for you to tell me that that's not true, that's kind of crazy, but <laughs> yeah. Um, what did y'all learn from each other? What are some moments where, um, where you realize, I mean, some of them are, that are so beautiful are in the film, but are there other ones that come to mind? <laughs> <You're pulling them. laughs> um, I've said this in a previous Q&A, but I honestly mean this. Um, working with Annabelle, not working with y'all, learning. learning and gaining a friendship with Annabelle and Tanyama has honestly given me a sense of, I don't know, like I, I, I feel more comfortable being my true self. Like they have given me the utmost support and guidance throughout this whole journey that, that we've been on. So I take away from them as just believing in myself more. And I cannot thank y'all enough for that. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I learned is that the kind of act of participating in environmental activism requires community, and community often results in friendship and being able to observe the different ways that each of us absorbed information and the different outlooks we had on it um, are further evidence for the necessity to learn together. And I think that's another great reason to like share the movie even more um, because now all of you have a different outlook on it and you are a part of the family now of learning with us. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that. Community has been so important because, I mean, everything that we learned was, was so heavy. Like, I think about just being, you know, at the, at the plantation after Robin, and I, I love the fact that we were there talking about that together and kind of, you know, collecting everything. And it's, um, it's so important because, you know, um, facing climate change is not something that anyone can do on their own. So I'm so grateful I did have you guys <laughs> with, because it, it's, it's, it is so heavy. But when we think about how all of us care about it, all of us can come together for it, it definitely strengthens us. So I hope you guys can like see our friendship and as well, like feel that as well. One thing that, uh, there's so many things that, again, move me about the film. It's something that I want everyone to see, this, particularly in southern Louisiana, but there's so many ways that it relates to elsewhere in the world. And when I think of you, Kira, as um, a friend and colleague uh, being here, I'd just love to hear your perspective on what inspired you to make the film. And, and I think one of the wild things, that ways that it's been a gift in my life, um, in addition to the, like, the, the long timeline that it sets up for us to learn about and be able to understand our surroundings more is just the, the role of infrastructure in our lives and engineering. And just seeing you all hang out on this oil rig and come to know one another like in that setting is, is really profound to me because so many of those things that um, our lives depend on in a variety of ways and, and that impact us so deeply are, are hidden and not visible. So if you could just share some about the, some of the choices you made in, in coming to making the film. Um, and just I want to say how much I admired the, how, you, how you and your team like laid out just the exposition of the film and the complexity of the connections that you're making over time throughout the film and how, how beautiful that is. And I, I know how, how challenging that is to, to describe um, and really clearly educate us 
in what is happening around us. Yeah, it's very, very hard. <laughs> Every issue in this state uh, is connected to myriad other issues. You can't talk about one without there being um, so many other problems. So um, I, before this film, I made a short film that's 15 minutes long and it's about a young person exploring the pump station system in Louisiana or New Orleans rather, and um, as, she, uh, as she learns about this underground system, she comes to connect it to herself and her own identity and the ways that she feels oppressed um, like water. And uh, it was such a powerful experience to learn alongside this young person in, the, in this short 15 minute film um, that I wanted to expand it into a, a longer film about a larger drainage basin. <laughs> um, so <laughs> moving from the pump station system into New Orleans to the Mississippi River Basin with um, not one but three young people who lived in um, different geographies in this place um, and and seeing if together we could figure out uh, how the river shaped us and how our infrastructure shapes us, um, particularly as uh, women here. Yeah. Another, uh, this will be my last question, then I'm gonna open it up, but I could ask all things all night. But one of the things that is so beautiful in the film is the sound and the, um, all the sounds in the film, the sound design, the location recording, your voices, your singing. Uh, and we're doing a project um, through the Center for the Gulf South where uh, Dr. Frazier and I have been um, hosting and organizing a series called Anthroposonic and considering the intersections of music, sound studies, and climate change, and racial and social justice. And we've invited a different artist every semester for the past year and a half to collaborate with us and present work at, at that intersection. And we just took a group of, of mostly students and some members of the public and uh, out to a lily bayou near Lake Moropa. And, um, and an artist, Demi Ward, who also works with us, recorded sounds in the landscape is gonna make a composition. But just uh, having this focus on sound and moving through that experience really changed the day for me. Like we were, when we set out, we went under the interstate in our kayaks and I felt the vibration of that, of that infrastructure and the, and the sound of the traffic. And then as we moved further into the bayou, there were more animal sounds or we could hear them more, they weren't masked. Anyhow, I just wanted to bring that question to y'all this evening um, and just think about one, like the way that you all listen to one another and listen to the people who are sharing information is really beautiful to me. And we've been able to, we're here listening to y'all. The, um, can you just speak of any sound that comes to mind when I ask that from the landscape or from the film um, and elaborate if you want or not, but I would just love to hear what you think. And then Kira also at some point to um, hear about your process in designing the soundscape. Sound is something that so often overlooks, gets overlooked in film, um, but is essential. And um, I'm grateful that my first lesson in filmmaking was if it sounds good, it looks good because it's so hard to tolerate sound that we can't hear if we want to understand what's happening. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll pitch that to y'all now. I have, um, what I think about being at the Old River control structure, you can hear the Mississippi River rushing very, very, and it's just this contradiction of knowing how powerful and how like, how much force it has. And um, yet it's like being controlled. And that was definitely, um, like being able to hear it kind of makes it more alive, knowing that like this this bo this body of water is oh well, not body of water but <laughs> it's force it's flowing it's it it's and and it's sad that it's being controlled just like how it's like alive just like us. Um, I think throughout the film there were like di varying pitches of like the grumbling of flowing water and it kind of it makes you think about like I don't know this grumbling I, I personify a lot of nature like the 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 ending little song that I sang I was like personifying a tree no 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 singing <laughs> no singing um, 
<laughs> and I, I think especially today, whenever I was listening to like the grumbling at the old river control structure, it, it kind of feels like the grumbling of mother nature. And like, even whenever things seem like they're going okay, there's always like an underlying passing of water that is influencing our structures and ecosystems, whether we're regarding it or not actively. Um, I too will talk about the water. <laughs> so <laughs> the sound of the water crashing um, um, like against the boat, it's, you know, it, it, it could be scary if it's like, you know, strong and forceful, but also take into account this slow, just cruising waves and just smashing. Anytime I've, I've ever been on a boat and I hear that, I can go straight to sleep. It's, it's, it's peaceful to me. Um, but not only that, I was asked a question the other day and they, they asked me, um, um, are you scared um, to lose your home? And I'm like, are, are, like, are you scared knowing, like, knowing something's coming? And I'm like, you can wake up and be scared every day, but if you live with that, then you will never experience, you know, life as it is. L life is beautiful. You can't take, you can't live with having fear that something's gonna happen. It's like you said about being scared. You, you can't do that. Cause then you miss out on the opportunities that are right in front of you, but you're too worried about being scared. So y'all water, forceful, mind, slow, bringing back memories of just taking a good nap on a boat. <laughs> I don't think I can say anything better than that. <laughs> water. Oh, all the water sounds are intentional. Uh, intentional water sound design. Um, so when you hear, when you see the levees, you're hearing constrained, restrained water. Um, and when you're in more organic, natural places, you're hearing more free flowing water. Um, and it's it's working on a very subtle level throughout the film. And a shout out to your beautiful composer, Free yeah. For All. Free is amazing. And who, is, who did the sound design? Arjun Sheath, he's also totally amazing. Yeah. So let's open it up to the audience. Um, and I'm curious, I, want, I would like to foreground any student voices. If there are any students who have questions, uh, we want to kick it to y'all first. Yes. Um, first, thanks to y'all for being vulnerable and doing this work. It really is extremely meaningful. I'm from home as well, about 10 years older than you guys. And I spent my entire life basically trying to articulate what you guys did really so, so thoroughly and so mean, like, movingly. Um, I guess my question is, do you know from this experience, like, the moment that things say you click to you? Like, I grew up in going to public school where I learned all these factors but never the synthesis of how it all worked together in the system. So now having had this kind of like experience, do you think that it's changed what you're going to do with your life or how you communicate about where you're from? Um. I want to get an answer from being home <laughs> Yep. Um. Um, so as soon as you said that, I immediately thought about being at that little restaurant and watching that video clip of the land just slowly disappearing. Like, that was the first time I've ever seen that, like, on a screen. I mean, like I said, I've had teachers tell me home would be underwater. I, I knew that, you know, we lose a football field every hour. And when you hear that, you're like, okay. But actually, like, actually seeing it, it's like, wow. So um, for me, that, you know, and then... Like I said, you know, I can go back to old spots and I'm like, wow, this is, I see it on the screen, but now I can also see it visibly. Um, so yeah, I, it, it makes me, you know, like what, what can we do, you know, to preserve the little land that we have left before it is nothing but water and then we also have no land for our homes. You know, it makes everyone relocate and I, I'm a big homer person, like, you know, I have family who no longer who no longer live in home, and they come down as as their vacation to Homa. And I'm like, you coming to Homa for vacation? I mi I miss being home. I miss the bayou. I miss just being here. And that's it. I mean, it's a, that's what it's about coming back home and being in the scenery that that you've seen all your life. 
Yeah. Who else? So. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say like 1897, just knowing that, you know, some things are actually very. I mean, we 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 learn about you know. Okay, we need to fix the the all the problems with the environment and it's all these little factors. But we, I don't think I really ever it ever clicked until that moment that everything was deliberately, um, um, like. Everything were choices made over decades. That was really um, key for me. Because it's like, oh, you need to save water and you need to recycle. But it's like, <laughs> why? <laughs> um, I, I think the moment that things started clicking for me was when I visited the Whitney Plantation because it kind of showed me like, how much of history has promoted the restriction of our of our um, natural ecosystems as well as our fellow individuals, um, accompanied with learning about Cancer Alley and how the effects are still present today, um, and so in, so seeing like a broader picture kind of allowed everything else to fall into place. Other questions? Yes. Hello, Professor. I want to echo what was said. Thank you for being so vulnerable, so brave. Um, this is a question from Kira. How, how did you learn it? <laughs> um, well, Lauren Cargo, who's sitting over there, uh, and Chachi and I spent a very long time driving uh, sometimes together, sometimes separately around the state, interviewing young people and asking them what they noticed in their changing environments. Um, and at the same time, we were sending emails to friends. And I knew I wanted to work with three young people in different geographical locations. Um, and so I was emailing friends saying, like, do you know any young person who's curious and cool and, you know, might want to oddly be on camera for an extended period of time. And uh, I got a bunch of emails back, and it was those emails from friends, ultimately, um, that led me to these three. And it was multiple people in their communities who were like, Annabelle, Danielle, Mom, Mackenzie. <laughs> so, um, and, and then they all asked really beautiful questions about why why their community was flooding so much or why they weren't being taught about these issues in school or no, why was nobody talking about sink, like the land sinking. Um, and I had really compelling conversations with each of them and that was it. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Um, again, just amazing. <laughs> I'm a seventh grade teacher, and I so want to show this in my class. I'm very excited. Um, I first thing that popped in my head when you all were at the Army Corps of Engineers, you were talking to the front lady at the desk, and then a public affairs guy. Were scientists not available or engineers to talk to when you were there? Uh, the woman actually who we were talking to is an engineer. Yeah, she was, I think, following Army Corps protocol and, as you saw, um, regurgitating what she was supposed to say. Yeah. We, we didn't, ex we didn't, we weren't intending to set her up either. That, that just happened, that organically occurred. <laughs> yes, Grace. Yeah, thanks so much. Y'all are very inspiring. This is really beautiful to watch. I, I just was curious what y'all are up to now. Like, what you're curious about, whether it's around climate, environmental stuff, or whether it's just like, what are you doing with your life? Shall I? Yeah, so right now I am a senior in graphic design at LSU. And, like, it's remarkable how much this project has influenced the things that I'm creating. So right now I'm doing my 
final thesis project. And it's really central around bringing people back into Louisiana because I started my research recognizing um, like cultural trauma that has existed in Cajun communities. And it, it was such a hard and difficult topic to just express to a community. And so I, I developed this kind of call to action to invite people back to this beautifully blooming community in the South. Um, and Cajun? Oh. Cajun community? Yeah, the Lafayette, New Orleans, everywhere in the South. Um, Southern Louisiana in particular. But it was heavily influenced by the knowledge and appreciation that I have for my community that I learned through this, through this film. I'm currently still in Homa, I'm working. Um, lately what I've been doing, and I'm very proud of this, um, they, you know, so I've been taking off work to come to screenings, and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, watch my trailer. This is my trailer. <laughs> and they're like, it's only a minute. I'm like, yeah, you gotta come, you gotta come with me one day and watch it. They're like, okay. So my thing is, whatever, I'm just, I don't know what we're doing next, but we're gonna do something next. But my thing is spreading what, what, what we already experienced to people around me. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Okay, um, I'm studying computer engineering and I want to go into research on how to build tech more sustainably using materials in a better way and increasing access to technology. That's what I really want to do. So I'm, I'm doing computer engineering and some international studies with the concentration in environment and development. So um, I, I mean, I've wanted to be a computer engineer since I was pretty young, but the film definitely um, allowed me to, uh, you know, create a space where I can think about our community and and still be my myself and, and bring my experiences into my field. <laughs> Yes. Oh, how, if so at all, did it change the way that you feel about where you're from? <coughs> you grown up in different places, but like have this shared common river and experiences with the river and flooding. Oh, okay. Um, oh. Being from Baton Rouge and, you know, seeing the oil refineries, it made me think about how Louisiana has a toxic relationship with oil and it's kind of like you know we need to value ourselves we need to value the culture we have that it's priceless and um it, it, yeah that that made me think about how um you know even though it ha uh, we have this strong tie to oil it's not benefiting us so yeah time to change things so <laughs> sorry um, I would say to enjoy where you live and appreciate it because you never know what can happen, but also to come together as a community and try to see what you can do as a, as a whole rather than have one person try to do it all by themselves because that's not going to happen. So staying together as a community and still enjoying where you live and loving where you live. Honestly, like loving where you live, that's like the whole motivation behind like preserving Louisiana environment. It's like, that's the drive. That wasn't my initial answer, but it's just like, I love where I live. I wanna preserve it. I want everybody to come here and, and celebrate with us. Um, but I think what I understand about my community, I guess in Lafayette is I address it with um, a critical eye with, but also a patient eye, like understanding the truths about enslaved people in our history, but also understanding you can't change history, you can change the future, um, hopefully for the better. Yes, Daniela. I have a question when you do all the screenings, do uh, the 
reactions differ in terms of the age of the, the audience? You know, like do older people respond differently to the movie than your peers, let's say? Or what are generally the, the reactions from the general public? I'm trying to think. I mean, I think it's kind of similar. Yeah, y'all just say it in different different ways. If that makes because we always get uh, Army Car of Engineer questions, and then yeah, it's pretty much. It. Yeah, I think there's a really good response. Everyone is blown away in, in one way or another. That and I think that you know, even though we're young and we're bringing that perspective, I still think that it uh, is able to reach everyone. I think they can still find themselves, everyone can feel tied to our narrative to some degree, and yeah. Yeah, I think across all screenings, we've been met with this kind of reciprocation, um, which before, before we premiered, it was like, a kind of a buildup of nerves. It's like, how, how are people gonna see me when it's not about how are people gonna see me? It's about how are people gonna see the subject as a whole? Um, and there's been like outstanding reciprocation of what we're expressing. Still get nervous every time. <laughs> yeah, we um, have a survey and we'll send it to all of you, but these guys haven't seen it, but I can affirm that the surveys <laughs> sort of uh, echo what all of them are are um, reporting. Hey, uh, I've heard. I think it's Miriam Kaba has like very commonly she's an abolitionist contemporary who says like hope is a choice. And so I'm wondering, as you all are you know articulated at the end of the film, like this is the world you're going to be inheriting. And so what sort of where are you finding hope and what changes would you want to see that are working towards that preservation you were talking about, Annabelle? And then um, are there any efforts that you would want to highlight particularly that are inspiring to you? I think in my own life, um, especially recently, what kind of brings me hope is like reconnecting with my community. I think whenever I moved away from Lafayette to Baton Rouge, I kind of felt this need to like run away from home and find myself. <laughs> yeah, except like the only thing I've realized is that I, I just, I love the place that I'm from and um, it, it is what gives me hope. Like I, this is one example that like brings such a smile to my face. This past summer I, was back in Lafayette and I was living with my parents and my dad invited me to a Cajun jam and I just sat on the sidelines. I don't really know, I forgot how to Cajun dance, can't play any Cajun instruments, but just the, the, the opportunity to be there and observe just like fueled my soul. Yeah, everybody go to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh. you go. <laughs> okay. Um, when you said that that hope is a choice, I think it, it made me think about um, just how the the biggest problem we tend to face is that people think it's impossible or that it's insurmountable of issues and. Um, I, I think just thinking about how, in the same manner that, you know, decisions have resulted in what we are faced now, in the same way decisions are the only thing that can, you know, counteract that. Um, it is a choice to, uh, to come together. It is a choice to uh, do what you can with what you have, and, it, and it's a choice to talk about it, have these, these, these discussions. I, I, I mean, what I really, I guess, hope to see, or I, I hope to change is, uh, or the, what I hope to, what changes I hope to see, um, it's just that there's just so much of a taboo, per like, period, in talking about 
um, the environment sometimes. I, I want there to be a more of a comfortability just so that, you know, it's, so all the, the device of, the divisiveness, the divided, <laughs> that, it, that, that, you know, I want everyone to be able to see that no matter where you are, where you're from, what you're going through, who you are, like, it, it's all of our problems, so, yeah. Community, yeah. Um, my thing is that Miss Tammy, who I was on there with, um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't talk very well. Um, so she said that it's gonna be hard for us uh, to stay a tribe. And I, it brought back to mind that down uh, in Ponishan, uh along the island road, there are people who are refusing to leave. So that gives me hope that, you know, people may flee from Homa, flee from the bayou, but there's some of us who still live there and who will not give up their home that easily. So that's, that's my hope to still being a tribe and keeping that language alive and Hopefully one day I too can learn it if I can master English first. <laughs> All right, let's have one last question. Um, I, this might be more for Kira, but um, what, like, how do you choose Hollow Tree, and like, what does the title mean to you? Um, how did I, well, I just wanted to say quickly to the other question and then I'll answer that question that I think also learning is hopeful. Once you see something one way, you can't ever go back. Um, and I think together we demonstrated that. Um, hollow tree, I first saw hollow trees when I was making a short film many years ago and they were just so evocative as an image. Um, and, and the way that we learn in this film is by looking at our environment together and noticing it and asking questions about it. Why are the trees hollow? Why are there so many stumps? Why is it flooding so often? Uh, why is the land sinking? Why are there potholes everywhere? Um, so the hollow tree is sort of a, a starting point. Um, why is, why is the tree hollow? And, and the answer reveals a lot about um, the system of economic systems of exploitation and control um, that we're living under and that shape our natural and unnatural world and uh, ourselves. So it, it is one manifestation of that. Um, do you wanna add anything having written lyrics about hollow tree and, and been, and he spent a lot of time there. Yeah, let's think of that for a second. Yeah. I think I can speak on the lyrics in that um, earlier I mentioned I tend to personify nature. Um, and I think in, in that last song, I was, I was trying to express the nature of the tree itself, how though its core is empty, its walls still stood strong. And so this kind of metaphorical heart still persevered. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Any other final meditations on the hollow tree? Or a hollow tree, hollow tree? No, all right. All right, we are gonna um, have a reception for anyone who wants to continue the conversation and, and be with everyone uh, over in Newcomb Hall and we'll direct you there once we, once we are, are closed. I thank you all so much, so deeply for making this film and for being here tonight and bringing your voices to Tulane. You're incredibly inspiring um, and, and generous, generous hearted. And um, I appreciate the, the risk that you took to, to co-create this and be your full selves on camera and, and here on campus. And I look forward to seeing how your lives unfold and how we continue living here together. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here with you tonight. Thank you for having us. Oh, and thank <laughs> it's you, a pleasure. Jimmy. So let's give them a big round of applause.